So um, we're just, uh, you know, we're going to change plans a little bit. We're going to have one more talk, and then we're going to have lunch. And so I'm going to shift gears and actually introduce our next speaker, who is uh, John Gabrielli. Just, uh, I didn't know if he knows he's speaking next. Um, uh, and it's a real pleasure for me to introduce John, specifically because how much his work has influenced uh, my own work. But uh, for those of you who know John, you know he actually has an eclectic background. He was a pioneer and already uh, 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 well known for his work on memory systems and higher order cognitive systems through his work uh, using neuropsychological approaches, uh, studies of patients with uh, brain damage, and also uh, elegant work using cognitive approaches. And, but uh, for our field, he was one of the first to really adopt as a mainstream tool in his laboratory these new neuroimaging approaches based on functional MRI to study these systems, and it was pioneering work. This work in the mid-90s, uh, uh, as I said, was the first demonstration I recall um, uh, where we saw how these tools can be used to measure what are very subtle signals during cognitive tasks, and he's gone on to have a long career applying these techniques, and so it's a real pleasure for me to introduce John, who uh, is a professor at MIT um, uh, and uh, uh, a pioneer in the field. Thank you. Good morning, or slightly good afternoon. Um, it's a really a pleasure here. So first of all, uh, you know, it's such a delight to hear about the roots of uh, the discoveries in our field, both at the science level and the human level, right? We all know that science is this weird mix of uh, a pursuit of truth, pursuit of things that will help people's lives be better, uh, and humans doing the work they do at a very human scale. Um, and I have, so this is a unique chance for me to thank the people who invented our field, who spoke this morning and spoke of their colleagues, both here and, and not here. And, and I, it's, it's a, I feel tremendous gratitude because for me personally, besides the important thing of the science, you know, my life has changed by the invention of fMRI. My entire career has been, uh, since my earliest work, has been built on fMRI. And even more than that, you guys are responsible for who I married and my children. Uh, because I met my wife, who's in the background, you'll hear from her later on, through our shared interest in fMRI, that's how we met, and now we have two beautiful daughters. So the, uh, the consequences of your discoveries about uh, MR have had a huge impact on my life, and I thank you for all of those. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, uh, the use of uh, MRI from a slightly historical perspective, and, and for those who are experts in memory, uh, for something they know, all of this about already, um, uh, using MR to understand how something amazing happens, how an experience that we can have changes our brain and endures it within us and changes who we are and defines who we will be. Um, and I'm old enough that, uh, I'm not so old that I work with Phineas Gage, but I'm old enough that I work with HM, the most famous uh, neurological patient of the last century. And you know his story that uh, to, for treatment of epilepsy, he had removed bilaterally both sides of the brain uh, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and surrounding tissue. And from that day forward uh, uh, until he passed away a few years ago, for all practical purposes, he never formed a new memory again. And he completely revolutionized this clinical case, our understanding of the mammalian, and including human, organization of memory, that these magical tiny structures sitting on the insides of the temporal lobes allow us to record the events and facts of our life. Uh, all the values we hold, all the knowledge we hold, our memories of people, places, and things we care about. And we know also from uh, other studies of patients with brain injuries, which was the only way we knew about how the brain remembered things in our lives, we also knew that injury to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex resulted in a more restricted kind of memory loss. So these patients were not globally amnesic like HM. HM was a kind of person who would not remember, uh, you know, he wouldn't know who the president was. Well. <laughs> 
wouldn't mind that sometimes. Um, uh, <laughs> or not, depends, it's not political. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, he wouldn't know who the president was, the wars had passed away, his own parents had passed away, uh, the people had been to the moon, all right? So patients with prefrontal cortex had much uh, more limited uh, injuries, but they had troubles in sort of what we might think of as the details of memory, how recently something happened, how frequently something happened, where you heard or when you heard something. And so we know that memory from a simple psychological analysis is composed of three stages over time. Encoding, that is when an experience uh, is perceived, you hear something, you see something, you feel something. Some magical consolidation or storage process that keeps that uh, memories in our brain. And then some amazing capacity to go and retrieve that knowledge for use. And functional imaging has allowed us to look at these steps separately. I mean, Randy has done fantastic work in this area. Chantelle has done fantastic work in this area. Um, and it just allows us to separate this. Because in a patient like HM, we couldn't separate those. If you spoke with him in an hour, for an hour, walked out of the room, and it came right back in, and he didn't know who you were, which I can guarantee you would happen, is that because he didn't make the memory, he couldn't keep the memory, or it's in there and he couldn't retrieve it? We couldn't pull those things apart. Um, and the other thing about memory is that we mostly don't remember much, but what we choose to remember is unbelievably powerful, right? So if I ask you what you were doing a year ago today, most of us will have almost no idea unless it was your birthday or anniversary or something, right? Uh, and so I teach introductory psychology, so I apologize for the next two demos, but you know, kind of fun. So that you consider the, the gazillion times that you've held a penny, you know that almost a trauma you have when four pennies come back and change, right, okay? So, and then you're asked, uh, as psychologists have shown, if you're asked the simple questions of, you know, which way is Lincoln facing, uh, uh, what's written above, below, to the left, or to the right, a thing that you guaranteed have seen thousands of times, if not tens of thousands, most people have no idea. Um, and if they get multiple choice, well, that becomes easy. The answer I know is A, okay? And that just shows you that what you choose to remember for whatever reason or what is thrust upon you to be remembered is a huge selection process. And that's the selection by which you know what you know and you, you are who you are. So here's the correct answer. Now, okay, you can say a penny, that's not important, but what's more important in your life than Google? So which of, the, so which of these is the uh, typical Google logo on non-special days? And the answer, I can look it up, uh, is this one. But the reason you don't remember, probably with certainty, is that it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so again, much of our lives drifts to us, but what stays with us, again, changes who we are. And so um, in 1998, building on the fantastic uh, discoveries, oh, I have to tell you one story. This. I remember around the time when this famous paper came out with the, 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 with the iconic figure that we heard about this morning and all the science behind that. I went to speak to a senior scientist at Stanford, which is where I was located then, and said, wow, they can use MRI to look at brain function. And the senior scientist looked at me and said, John, 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 MR is for structure, PET is for function, okay? <laughs> and I was already an assistant professor, so I thought I'd tell that this was a functional study, but I, was, I, I held myself back and double-checked, and it turns out it is for function um, in some, <laughs> and so, uh, um, so we had a pair of papers come out. That, uh, Randy's a co-author of one of the papers uh, um, and others uh, with Anthony Wagner showing uh, the first fMRI experiments that build on event-related designs where we could tie individual brain responses to individual outcomes of experience, whether they would be remembered or forgotten. And I have to say one thing about this. Uh, so often in science, you know, if you have a person who has a beer or two, maybe they'll have it later today, they tell you about who did the what to whom and what's not good and what's not right, and we're full of, you know, injustice and weird stuff in life. This was actually an amazingly positive experience because the authors of this paper were highly communicative with us about they're about to submit to science, and, and we, we uh, cited each other's work. So what could have been competitive papers, you know, bothering each other, were actually an incredibly collaborative, congenial, uh, good science, good people kind of story. Anyway, in, these, in our experiment, they looked at words. We heard uh, pictures with a thousand words, so we used pictures. Uh, Andy, sorry. Uh, so uh, here's, and we saw indoors and outdoor pictures. And then we simply uh, looked at a brain response in an event-related design as they saw each of these individually presented pictures. And we used a subsequent memory kind of design where we would uh, uh, look at how well people remembered pictures. Some they remembered, some they forgot. We would go back in time and ask in the scanner, what's different in your brain for an experience that would be, leave an enduring memory and change your brain via, via memory? And what's, what's the difference there versus an experience where you saw something but it left no trace? And what we found, and again, in these modest studies of the time in many ways, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, activation 
uh, in the medial temporal region, parathocampal cortex, that was greatest for pictures that would be remembered, that were fated to be remembered, compared to experiences that were fated to be forgotten within moments of the perception itself. And uh, Jim Brewer, the graduate student who, who was the first author, is now uh, a professor at UC San Diego. Every paper I'll present to you except the last, well, they're all, they're all postdocs or graduate students as first authors, and almost all of them are on faculty at different places now. Um, and in addition to these medial temporal spots where greater activation predicted a, a superior memory later on, we got spots from frontal cortex consistent with the neurological literature. Now some years later with Noah Offen, who's on now, who was a postdoc now on the faculty at Wayne State, uh, we did a study with a larger number of people, uh, you know, better methods, more subjects. It got huge activations in this uh, 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 parapocampal region as well as in frontal cortex. But now we asked a different question, which is, um, which we could not have asked of HM in any sense, which is, um, what is it like if you're a child? Is a child learned the same way, at least these scenes, as an adolescent or as an adult? What, what happens in development? And with Noah, we reported that if you looked in the medial temporal lobe at activations that predicted later memory, that looked very similar from age eight to young adulthood. But if you looked in frontal cortex, we saw a growth of activation that persisted not only from childhood to adolescence, but from adolescence to young adulthood. And so we could see this sort of a, a parallel development of one memory capacity being adult-like by age eight, and another memory capacity being adult-like when you're an adult. Now, what are the things that make us remember experiences we have? Two powerful influences are emotions, feelings, uh, that we know are partly related to the limbic system and the amygdala, per se. Um, and motivational systems, rewards, you know, what we're motivated to care about uh, that involves the reward system, the nucleus accumbens, and the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain. Um, now, we know from a brain injury study from the work of uh, Adolphs and Damasio that patients who have calcification developmentally to the amygdala, so that should be the amygdala, but it's not there, don't do something that you do. They don't remember something better if it's an emotionally intense than if it's boringly neutral, okay? They do, the mem emotions do not make something more likely remembered. If you have the amygdala, it's the exact opposite. What you will remember is not the boring everyday things, but the things that are powerfully wonderful or powerfully terrible. And so an experiment with Toron Conley, who's now a professor at St SUNY Sto uh, Stony Brook, uh, we did the following experiment. Um, we showed sort of neutral pictures, um, somewhat bad pictures. The next picture I'm showing to you is a baby that looks bad. So don't look for a moment if you don't want to see it, okay? That's a powerful picture, gone. Okay, so, uh, and then we looked again at individual responses for each uh, person. And um, what we found was this, uh, that uh, we had the people rate how bad the scenes were as they, as they saw them and then tested their memory a few days, uh, 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 three weeks later. While they were viewing the pictures, uh, this is the slow hemodynamic response of the bold signal, but it's kind of cool because there's so many experiments from so many people are shown. It's kind of cool to get an objective biological si signal for a subjective human experience. So here's a person saying terrible picture, somewhat bad, a little bad, and neutral, right? So here's a, in the amygdala, the subjective simil you know, is the, your subjective response and the subjective biological signal. And sure enough, and this, uh, I'll just briefly say that the more powerfully the amygdala was engaged, the more certain you were to remember just the emotionally powerful information. The amygdala seemed to not care about anything neutral. And in two other experiments, uh, um, we showed, uh, and we still don't fully understand this, I have to say, that uh, uh, we got lateralization that differed between men and women, and this has been replicated, so it means something, although, of course, men differ from each other, women differ from each other. Uh, here's one we understand a bit better with Mara Mather, now a professor at University of Southern California, um, which is that if we showed, now we were nicer, and we showed positive, neutral, and negative pictures, okay, <laughs> finally some positive pictures, birthday parties, puppies, or, so uh, for younger adults, their amygdala activation increased for both the positive and negative pictures, for older adults, just for the positive one. And this aligns with the finding that one of the few benefits of getting older is often a positivity bias, which is that you don't tend to, you tend to pay less attention to negative things and focus on positive things, okay. So, um, now, how about motivation with Alison Adcock, who's now a professor at Duke. Uh, we try to motivate people in a, crude, you know, in a crude way by simple money. 
We said you, before a picture came on, we said you'll get $5 if you remember this, or you'll get 10 cents. So we varied motivation. $5 big. This is actually an expensive experiment, I have to say. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that was, we were lucky we did that much before we tested the next day, because we just barely got an improvement in memory. But so people did remember the pictures where they were told, you, if you get this the next day, you'll get paid at $5 versus 10 cents. What's happening in the brain? So what's happening in the brain is for, uh, for pictures that are remembered, as that reward is shown before the picture arrives, as you know, like I'm motivated or not so motivated, we got activation related to subsequent memory in the reward system, in the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens. If, if, if the reward system is recruited, you're more likely to remember it. That's before the picture arrives. And when the picture arrives, we see activation differences occurring in the um, medial temporal lobe. So we think we have the separation between being motivated to learn and then that motivation acting on the medial temporal lobe to make learning itself occur. And now, sometimes you don't want to remember things. Um, we want to repress mem suppress memories. Uh, probably for all of us in an everyday thing, we like to suppress failures, embarrassments, and so on. Right? Uh, uh, um, uh, for patients something, with something like PTSD or patients who are depressed and ruminating about past events, successful suppression of haunting memories may actually be very beneficial. So uh, Sigmund Freud, a long time ago, uh, talked about uh, uh, repression versus suppression. Repression is, in his terminology, involuntary. Suppression is voluntary. With Mike Anderson, who's now at the University of Cambridge, uh, 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 Cambridge University, uh, has this amazing experiment. And he, this is all uh, uh, Mike's creativity. He found a way to experimentally show in the laboratory for the first time ever objective evidence that you can suppress a memory, okay? The, uh, the everyday life is full of this kind of stuff, but in the laboratory actually measured. And what he did is this, he showed pairs of words that you would try to memorize the pair, and in the middle you would keep trying to think about some, like steam. Others, when the first word came up, you were supposed to suppress your memory for roach. Now you know that often that doesn't work. If you tell people, you know, uh, you know don't think about the pink elephant, the first thing they'll think of is the pink elephant, right? But somehow this works. Um, and, and this is just the behavioral evidence for that, that he could experimentally show that if you practiced suppressing your memory for something you had learned, you would actually then have a suppressed memory for it below baseline. And so what we showed with Mike was that uh, uh, if we looked at activation during the suppression, we could show a suppression for the items you were trying to suppress in the hippocampus. Everywhere else we were trying to get memory up by motivation, by emotion, right? Now we're trying to get memory down. Um, yeah, but in, in areas of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that are probably working hard to suppress the memory, uh, there we got a positive activation. So we see some sort of trade-off between, you know, probably systems pushing down the memory, uh, acting on, uh, on the cortical system we know. Lastly, um, we don't want, everything I've shown you is what we usually do in fMRI, which is correlational, right? Correlated with memory, with motivation, with motion, with whether you're a younger and older person or a man or a woman. So the last experiment with Julie Yu, who uh, has not, does not have a faculty position, but she has a job that probably pays better than a faculty position. Uh, 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 we want to say, can we use fMRI to control your learning? The other way around, we're going we're to make the fMRI signal control your memory formation. And in this experiment, what we did is this. We looked back in this area that we know is important for memory for scenes. And we focused on an area called the parapocampal place area, discovered by Nancy Canwisher and Russell Epstein, a part of the parapocampal cortex that seems really important for memory for spatial location. And what we, the experiment was basically this. Participants lie in the scanner, um, uh, uh, and our, we just watch the fluctuations, the spontaneous fluctuations of the bold signal in that region. And then, using quasi-real-time fMRI, I say quasi because, as you know, we're, we're seconds later and all that kinds of stuff, but uh, online as the person's in the scanner. Every time that er the activation in that area compared to nearby tissue went up or down spontaneously, the person's just laying there doing whatever they're doing, things are rising or falling on, the, on their own, uh, that would drive the presentation of a stimulus. So if your brain was in a poor learning state, we would send something in. If your brain was in an optimal learning state, we would send something in. So what's driving the, whether you learn something or not is your brain state that drives when we present information, right? So can you imagine if you were a teacher, you would say like, okay, we're stopping this lecture 
until your, all your brain states are ready for learning, okay? <laughs> so we can't really quite do that. But, uh, and in fact, as Randy generously pointed out, you know, when your, when your mind is drifting off, you're actually in one half of his experiment, right? So, so, uh, but what we found um, is that uh, when we presented the stimulus, when your brain state was ready to learn, here's how well you learned it. When your brain state was not ready to learn, here's how well you learned it. So, so we could drive memory by taking advantage of natural fluctuations of your preparedness to learn this kind of information. So on this last slide, I just want to say that how grateful I am to be in this field uh, and, and, and for the inventors of the technology, for people like Randy and Chantel who developed it so much in memory, um, uh, that we could go you know, from everything, this is HM's uh, post-mortem brain, um, and then understand so much more, so much more richly. I mean, of course, forever the study of patients and, and lesion consequences will be part of our history and ongoing research as well. But the idea that we could look at mo emotion, motivation, variation, uh, suppression, brain states that are optimal or suboptimal for learning are things that we could never have accomplished even you know, with the largest number of patients with brain injuries and have really revolutionized our capacity to understand you know, what we learn, how we learn it, and who that makes us. Thank you very much. <laughs>